Hello, my name is Ed Fitzpatrick. I'm an EFAG board member and I cover the great state of Rhode Island for the Boston Globe. Uh, we're very pleased to have uh, Yamish Alcinder with us uh, tonight for the uh, as the 2021 Stephen Hamlet First Amendment Award recipient. To tell you a bit more about Yamish, she is the White House correspondent for the for the PBS NewsHour and a political contributor for NBC News and MSNBC. She often tells stories about the intersection of race and politics, as well as fatal police encounters. Uh, she is covering President Joe Biden's administration right now and the impact of the coronavirus pandemic. Before that, she covered the administration of former President Donald Trump and the impact of his policies and rhetoric on, the, on vulnerable populations domestically and internationally. Previously, she worked as a national political reporter for the New York Times and is a national breaking news reporter for USA Today. She earned a master's degree in broadcast news and documentary filmmaking from New York University and a bachelor's degree in English, government, and African-American studies from Georgetown University, a native of Miami. She's married to a fellow journalist and is the daughter of Haitian immigrants who met while attending Boston College. Yamish, just yesterday you were reporting uh, from Black Lives Matter Plaza on the reaction to the guilty verdicts in Derek Chauvin's trial and the murder of George Floyd. As a journalist, what are some of the key questions that you are focused on right now to gauge not just the reaction to the verdict, but the prospect for police reform legislation and the larger issue of addressing institutional racism in this country? Well, first, I want to say, Ed, thank you so much for that introduction. And thanks so much um, to everyone for inviting me here and for and for honoring me with this amazing award. I really, really appreciate it. Um, yesterday, of course, was a historic day. Um, a rare thing happened. A police officer was convicted of murder, um, second degree, third degree manslaughter. That is not something that we just see in our country. But of course, we also don't see very often, if at all, a man, an African-American man, um, choked to death on camera for 10 minutes. So the questions that I have now really are about, is this case um, an anomaly? Is this case so out of the, the, the realm of what we see in, in most police interactions that it may or may not have um, the kind of impact that people want it to have. So my big questions are, will this change the sort of blue wall of silence seeing all these officers um, testify against Derek Chauvin? Will he? Will we see other police chiefs stand up and say, you know what, if an officer in my, in my um, department does wrong, we're gonna go and we're gonna testify too. Also, what does this mean for the George Floyd P Justice and Policing Act? It's It's been a bill that's been lingering in Congress with Republicans and Democrats not being able to agree on much. Um, Senators Cory Booker and Senators Tim Scott, one Republican in Tim Scott and, and a Democrat in Cory Booker, two black men serving in the Senate are trying to work on this bill to come to some sort of compromise. But I wonder if this verdict changes that. So I've been on the phone with lawmakers today. They tell me that there is this inflection point and that they're really worried, especially on the Democratic side, not to let this moment pass because it is a point where everyone, it seems like, can now look at this and say, yes, that was a murder. Yes, that was, un that was not what we want our police to do. Um, I also think the last thing I would say is that I'm also really asking questions about the role that Americans play. I interviewed uh, the brother of George Floyd today, Flonis Floyd, um, on PBS NewsHour tonight. And one thing that he told me um, that sticks with me, was, with me is that if there wasn't this 17-year-old, Darnella Frazier, um, who was filming this and who had the wherewithal and to stomach standing there for almost 10 minutes and film in a very steady way, this death of George Floyd, he told me, George Floyd's brother, that his brother would likely just be another dead person killed by the police. Um, because of course, the official police account that was released soon after this incident didn't mention a knee on the neck, said that George Floyd had died from some sort of medical condition. So there's really this question of whether or not we as citizens, um, are people gonna feel more emboldened, more, more likely to engage when they see something that, that they find troubling? And what role might people play in physically getting involved? One of the things Darnell, Darnella Frazier, that 17 year old recorded, she said she stays up every night apologizing to George Floyd because she feels like she should have done more. And that to me is something that sticks with me as a reporter 
because I think she quite literally changed the world. But even she and probably many others are thinking, should that crowd have tried to physically push, remove that officer? And what would that have looked like? And how many people may have died then? Um, so I think that that's a big question for us as a society to say, what role will each of us play in trying to, to hold the police accountable? You know, we just saw the video of President Trump accusing you of asking a quote unquote racist question at another point. Uh, when you asked about disbanding the uh, White House pandemic office, he told you it was a nasty question. What do you make of those reactions and what is your strategy when you're speaking with officials who verbally attack journalists? You know, I am someone who really is focused on trying to be um, the kind of member of the press that working class people, a particularly vulnerable population in this country need. And that to me is, is a press that is focused on their issues, that's focused on surviving and thriving in this country, that's focused on um, kitchen table issues, and that we should, as a press, should be taking the issues um, that, that, that this country is facing and taking them to the leaders to try to hold them accountable. So in some ways, I, I try to be so focused on that that I don't get caught up in, in kind of back and forth. I think that when I see an official like the former president getting angry at the question, it means to me that we need to kind of continue to dig on that issue, continue to press forward um, to get some, some real anti. So overall, I would say that the, my reaction is I'm at work. I'm trying to do my job as best I can. And my work for me, luckily, is in the Constitution. So I have this incredible, I think, passion and connection to, to, to this being my purpose. And that um, then that I think is, is what has gotten me through those tense exchanges. And also, I would say, is, is getting me through when I have tough questions for this administration. You know, I remember when uh, CNN reporter Jeremy Diamond handed the microphone back to you after former President Trump didn't allow you to ask a follow-up question. How can journalists best support each other while covering conflict or confrontational sources? Is there enough support like that going on or do we need to do more? I think the White House press corps in particular, we really did um, get to a point where obviously we're competitors, we all work at different networks, but I think there was this sense of we have to make sure that we um, we really look out for each other and just allowing access. So Jeremy Diamond from CNN handing me the mic was a touching moment. And I remember talking to him afterwards, thanking him for that moment because it we thrive, I think, as a, as a country, if we can have questions and follow-up questions so that when officials don't answer our, our, our very specific and important questions that we can then kind of make sure that the public understands that by asking a pointed follow-up question. Let's remember um, around this time last year when we were in the throes of the pandemic, when everyone was terrified for their lives, we had an administration that was downplaying the virus, that was not wanting to ask, answer basic questions like, are we gonna get enough tests? And why, don't we, why aren't we ramping up um, PPE and what are we doing when it comes to, to where we stand with other countries and why don't we have this pandemics office that used to exist in the White House? Those were critical questions that were literally what people woke up thinking about in the throes of a pandemic. So I think we as a, as, as a community of journalists really realized that we had to do um, the, the people's work by in some ways banding together. That doesn't mean that we're gonna exchange all our questions or that we're gonna be some sort of group that's adversarial together with the, with, with the president. I don't think that you're ever gonna see that sort of coordination. We're not gonna walk out all at the same time. We're not activists, but I think there is this camaraderie and this respect among White House reporters that I really, really cherish. You know, we've got a new administration there in the White House. I was curious to hear what are the biggest challenges for journalists under the Biden administration? I think the biggest challenges are um, one that I think we, we, we are now entering this new phase where some of the people who used to cheer on journalists who thought we were kind of activists taking on Donald Trump, they might now be the same people who are angry at some of our questions. I've been talking to some of my White House colleagues and we're, we're hearing back from, from progressives and from liberal, liberal voters who say, hey, I really used to like your questions, but now you seem like you're being too tough on this president. And in fact, we're all just kind of doing our jobs the way we do them, which is holding leaders accountable and asking tough questions and making sure we're we're pushing for answers. Um, and I think that we really 
need to, I think, in some ways teach the, the, the public, but also kind of do a reset amongst ourselves also to understand that we're now in this new phase and that people might not like the, our questions because they're now um, looking at it from a different political lens. I also think that the interesting thing covering the Biden administration is that there is a lot of policy to cover. So in the Trump administration, a lot of it was personnel. He was firing people. He was you know, going off on Twitter. He was changing policy on Twitter. But there was there was not this robust intellectual, let's think through these problems, let's pass on multiple bills, let's have a bunch of legislation. So I think some of the challenges in the Biden administration is, is keeping track of what all the moving parts are and also holding the president accountable. So we'll say for one instance, there's this issue of refugee caps where the president made a campaign promise um, to, to raise the, the number of refugees that are allowed into the United States. He has not kept that promise. Um, and we've been pushing the White House to say, why isn't he doing this? He's gotten a lot of criticism from progressives in his own party, as well as the Democratic leadership, um, Senator Dick Durbin, as well as Representative Pramila Jayapal, um, really going to, taking him to task, saying this is not OK. But that, in some ways, gets lost with all the other legislation that's happening with the immigration and the gun reform and infrastructure and COVID. So I think it also is really important to try to balance all of the different things that are happening. Some journalists covering protests over the police fatal shooting of Dante Wright, 20 year old black man in suburban Minneapolis say officers have harassed and assaulted them despite a federal order uh, to leave them alone. The governor there in Minnesota said, apologies are not enough, it just cannot happen. What do you make of that situation? What's it show and what needs to happen to make sure it doesn't happen again? I think what it shows is how fragile democracy and the freedom of the press is. I um, mean, you know, after January 6th, we saw how fragile our democracy is. We saw a group of people um, overrun the headquarters of the Congress, something that I just never thought I would see. Um, we saw a, a group of people whose minds were frankly poisoned by this big lie that the election had been stolen from former President Trump, um, try to literally stop democracy from taking place. Fast forward, and you now see in, in Minnesota, um, officials targeting journalists, um, not believing them when they say that they have their IDs, trying to harass and intimidate them out of covering the stories. This is the kind of stuff that is, is unacceptable in a democracy. We have to be very vocal about pushing back. And I think about my, my time covering um, the protests in Ferguson, Missouri, and there was this, this rule where that, they, that, that, that was made that you couldn't stand still on a sidewalk. So if you wanted to cover the story in Ferguson, you literally had to keep moving. So I remember night after night for weeks, having to walk in a circle, walking with elderly people, 90 year olds, 80 year olds who just want to come, who wanted to come out and have their voices heard, being forced to, to really physically um, do things that they just were not up to. And fast forward and that that policy, that rule to try to keep to, to, that had everyone moving and, and that the police would arrest you if you didn't stop moving, that was ruled unconstitutional. And it struck me as we followed that rule. We didn't argue with that rule because we were scared of what could happen. We didn't want to get arrested. We didn't want to be, we, we, I didn't want to, to kind of cross the police in this, in this fraught moment. But it's those things that remind us that that was literally unconstitutional. So we have to still be very vigilant about um, really cherishing our, our First Amendment rights and fighting for them. You know, there are a lot of uh, college students in the audience tonight. Uh, what advice would you give them about being a journalist, especially to young women and people of color? The advice I would give um, young journalists as well as definitely women of color um, is to one, really find a support system that believes in you and that will have your back. So for me, I was lucky. I, there's a woman named Athalia Knight who was a longtime Washington Post reporter. She was also really good friends with Gwen Eiffel, who was another mentor of mine. Um, and there's Nicole Hannah-Jones at the, at the New York Times and a couple others that are really the people that when I'm thinking of a job or I get into a situation where I don't know how to tell a story or I feel overwhelmed, those are the people who have had my back, who can tell me, this is what you should do. This is how you should game out your career. Here's the best decision. Um, 
you really have to have people that will guide you and help you. And that doesn't doesn't mean that they have to be, you know, veteran journalists. Of course, it's great to have veteran journalists that are 20, 30 years older than you. It could also mean having someone who's a year older than you. Maybe you're a freshman and the sophomore ahead of you, they had an internship at the Washington Post a year before. That person can help you. So I really think, think of mentorship, not just as something that, that is your professors, but also the fellow, your fellow students. Some of the best people that I've talked to are, and people that I bounce ideas off of are my same age. And I consider them to be peer mentors. The other thing I think is important is to really be flexible. I remember when I was starting out, I really wanted to work in Miami. I graduated during the financial crash. I could not get a job in Miami. The Miami Herald would not hire me. So I had to go and live in Long Island and work for Newsday. It was not fun. I was super lonely. I was cold. I was covering snow and I hate snow, Um, but I did it, right? I did it because what else was I going to do? I wanted to be a journalist. So for me, I think it's also about really having fortitude to do the stories that maybe aren't the greatest stories. Maybe you want to be a civil rights journalist or you want to be a White House correspondent, but you have to start somewhere. So I remember covering, I literally once drove for two hours because there were puppies missing on Long Island. And my my my, my editor told me this was the story that I needed to handle. So those are the type of things that I think I started out doing. But because my editor saw I was the reporter who you could call at any time and I would go out no matter the story, I was then able to do stories about race and about justice and about all these other things. And that turned into becoming a national reporter and and focusing on those issues. So I really think it's about being flexible, being open, doing the job that you can get very, very well. Applying, I had applied to over two, I don't remember my first job, I applied to over 200 places. It is not easy to get a journalism job. I know that, especially during the pandemic. I can't imagine how many applications you students have to do now. But know that if you want to be a journalist, if you want to stick to it, you can do it. So I, I really think it's also believing in yourself and being really open minded. And it, we've got a. I want to hear what happened to the puppies as a follow up question. But the, I, I also we have a question from board member Rob Berti who, who to follow up on that. I wonder if you could talk about the special challenges that a female journalist of color faces within media entities. To what extent is diversity important in terms of the quality of news coverage, and what additional steps media in New England and elsewhere should be taking to increase journalistic diversity and ensure the safety of all journalists. Well, I think diversity is just core um, to any newsroom. It is not just, I think, this nice thing that you're doing. You're not doing Black people or Asians or uh, Latinos um, a, a favor by hiring them. Your newsroom is better when you hire people who are diverse. Your newsroom is better when you hire people who are from different parts of the country. I have in-laws who live in rural Virginia. They've taught me so much about what it means to have access to good broadband and what it means when you don't have access to good broadband. I would not know that if I didn't have in-laws that I then drove to and lost cell phone service on the way. And then I had a, a nephew who was trying to go to school online with no cell phone service in his neighborhood. It's those type of experiences. So I would say diversity, of course, in race, of course, in gender, but also in experience. When one of the best one of the best editors i ever had was a carpenter for 20 years he was a blue collar worker who did something that had nothing to do with journals and then became a journalist i think all of that adds to people's value. You want a newsroom where people understand what it means to be out working, what it means to be out um, covering some of these things. So I, I so I really feel like diversity has to be this kind of this real this it has to be as integral i think to the, it has diversity has to be as important as buying notebooks, as buying pens, as buying computers. The mo- you can't just assemble a newsroom and then say, okay, we're going to think of diversity. It really has to be, I think, a ground up level thing. I would also say that the media, at least in my experience, is still overwhelmingly white. the The studies that I've seen have said that the media is something like three to six percent um, African American. This is this is a real issue, and I think that when you are a diverse um, reporter, especially if you're a black reporter, especially if you're a woman, you will run into to, to, to situations um, where your life experience might be seen as 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 something that's a bias. There might be people who um, don't value the 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 diversity that you bring, the diversity of thought that you bring. Um, I think all that is in some ways changing. I will say, and I'll say for me in particular, in my experience, I really um, am grateful that everywhere that I've worked. Have, have embraced the experiences that I that I br- bring to the table. And I say that even to young journalists, right? So there's, maybe you're a young white journalist and so you're watching and saying, okay, well, that's diversity. You are diversity in your newsroom. Newsrooms are not filled with 22 year olds. So when you come there and you're like, well, this story is happening on TikTok, 
You are going to be the person who's going to see that story. I'm not going to see that story. My editor's not going to see that story. So I think that use whatever tools you have as a young journalist, the way that you're living your life, the, the, the food that you're eating, the movies that you're watching, use all of that to try to bring in new ideas, freshness into newsrooms. I remember when Trayvon Martin was killed and there were all these newsroom conversations at USA Today and other places. I was working at USA Today at the time. This robust conversation about, you know, was he a troubled teen and, and kind of how, how should we write about this kid? And I'm from Miami and I was around his age and I grew up at a high school across the street from, um, I, grew, I grew up across the street from the high school where Trayvon Martin went to school. So I could say definitively having gold teeth, smoking weed, liking to watch wrestling, liking to watch MMA, those things are quite normal for a 17 year old in Miami. It might be hard to say out loud, but if we are honest with ourselves, who among us in, in this in this world have not heard of teenagers smoking weed, right? So in some ways, I think we had to pull back and say, let's really look at this situation. We have a teenager who is walking home, who was unarmed, who was killed in a neighborhood where he had the right to be. So what do we talk about that? So I think for me, I had a newsroom that embraced that. I had a newsroom that didn't say, oh, well, you're biased because you're from Miami. I had a newsroom that said, hmm, you know what? I'm from Rhode Island. That is, it's, it, it can be normal in my neighborhood too. So I really feel like having those honest conversations is part of why I think diversity is core to newsrooms. Interesting question from board president, Karen Bordolo. She says, Objective, objectivity as a tenant of journalism has been debated recently. What's your position on this? Do you think that objectivity is still a tenant of journalism? I think it's fairness. Um, I think of Judy Woodruff, who's the anchor of News Hour. She she's really smart in answering this question. She says, you know, I'm a, a I'm an, I'm a human being, even though I'm anchoring the News Hour. Her she is, of course, anchoring the News Hour every night. I am doing this through a human body. So yesterday, when I was thinking about how, how I was going to report on the verdict. Um, I knew that part of it was going to be emotional for me because I'm an African-American woman who knows African-American men, who's married to an African-American man, um, who's been stopped by the police, who myself has been stopped by the police a number of times. So I knew that I was bringing that um, that to the table. So in some ways, I think, I don't know if, if, if it's about being a quote unquote objective, because I think we're all, we all are bringing, coming to the table with our implicit bias. I think it's about being fair. And part of that means that I interview police officers, right? Part of it means that I'm, that I'm talking to people. I remember interviewing George Zimmerman's family. I talked to his brother a lot. Um, I think all of those, all, all of those factors need to be part of, of how we do our journalism and, and we need to check ourselves, right? If you know that you're going into a story and you know how you feel and you know what you think about this story, then try to work against that. If you think, you know, this, the, I, I think this, this state should be doing this, um, this, this issue one way, then make sure to interview people and include people in your story that think the opposite of you. I think being real with yourself and being real with your newsroom about how you feel, I think at least gets us to fairness. Board member Mike Stan asks, uh, where should the press draw the line between showing graphic videos of police brutality to reveal what happened while also being sensitive to the trauma that it can cause? It's a great question. Um, and I think that we have to err on the, the, the side of being sensitive. People can find a lot of these videos. If you wanted to see the 10 minute video of George um, Floyd dying, you can find that on the internet. You can find it on Facebook. I think for me, um, newsrooms need to be very careful about showing people dying, especially because I think we factor into that whose deaths are we seeing, right? How many times are we seeing black men die? And we have to ask ourselves, well, if this was a video of a white woman or of a, or of a baby, would we show this? What well, would we show this image? I think in the in those answers are the fair way to try to show video. Sometimes I think you can't sugarcoat what happened to George Floyd. You have to in some way show screenshots or maybe stills. Um, but I also think that we have to we have to we have to really balance. Yes, reporting the story while also knowing that we don't want to to re, to traumatize people even further, especially as, as in, in in this moment where so many people are mourning the loss of their loved ones, where so many people are triggered by what they're seeing. Uh, one more question um, from Callie Ferguson. As a reporter focused on issues that affect everyday people, but covering those issues for, for a national audience from a national perspective, how do you build and maintain relationships with ordinary people from different local communities? Well, one, I talk to my family a lot. <laughs> um, I am the daughter of, of Haitian immigrants who met at Boston College. So my, my dad runs a big non nonprofit for, uh, actually it's kind of small nonprofit, I should say, for disabled people. 
And my mother is a retired social worker. She worked for 35 years. I can't tell you how many story ideas I get just from talking to my mother. Social workers see so much. At this point, my mom literally demands co-buy lines because she's like, you stole that story from my work day. I need to co-buy line, right? So I really feel like it's talking to my family. It's talking to my husband. It's talking to my in-laws who I said live in rural Virginia. It's going out on days like yesterday. Um, the verdict happened and I had a decision to make. Did I want to stay in the studio and kind of interview guests for my home? Or did I want to run out and talk to people outside the White House? 95% of the time, I'm always going to want to go out on the street. I was thinking about it just yesterday. I am inherently a street reporter. It's how I started out. It's how I feel most alive. It's how I feel like I'm really walking in my purpose by talking to regular everyday people, especially as a White House reporter. I think it can be so easy to get caught up in calling sources and Capitol Hill and all these people are elected officials or talking to you from their offices. But I think you have to incorporate everyday people, what they're talking about, or you will, I think, become, um, you will, you will become disconnected with just everyday life. I also will say I, um, even though I'm not on TikTok, I'm on Twitter a lot, right? I'm, I'm clicking through Twitter. I'm looking at what black Twitter is talking about. I'm looking at what Twitter as a whole is talking about. I'm looking about, looking at what's trending. All of that to me, um, it, it factors into how I do my journalism. And I, I remember, um, when I was covering pres former President Trump, I told um, a, a number of my colleagues, you don't even understand this presidency if you haven't watched The Apprentice. Like you, if you wa don't watch The Apprentice and then try to cover former President Trump, you're literally going to miss the like the, the entire thing because ha half of it was like entertainment, right? Half of it was him kind of joking and feeling like he was in a reality TV show. So I, I'm going to fire the state, the secretary of state. Oh, then I'm going to fire James Comey. Then we're going to watch James Comey, Comey come back to the white, come back to the airport. I remember um, he was in LA. So there were like helicopters that were literally following James Comey's um, motorcade. All of that felt like this is the scene out of an apprentice show that 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 Trump that President Trump wanted. So I think you have to in some ways be connected to pop culture in some ways. Um, I remember lastly, this was a young African American man who was supporting President Trump. He told me one of the reasons why he was supporting President Trump was because his first idea of wealth, the first idea of being rich, of being successful, was tied to Donald Trump because of the Simpsons. And I had to admit to myself that being around the same age as that guy, the first time I ever thought of someone who was filthy rich was Donald Trump because of the Simpsons. I remember as a child watching it and being like, oh, there's the, there's the rich guy on the Simpsons. So I really think that we as a society, if you don't at least get that, and it, it really, you, you in some ways can lose the story because you're so kind of in the weeds on policy and on kind of the high, the, the, the kind of high level um, debates. You can miss the fact that there's just kind of something staring in your face, which is that a lot of people thought that he had a lot of money, that he was a successful businessman, that he had African-Americans and Latinos around him tangentially. So they voted for him. This has been very interesting and very valuable. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us. Congratulations on being the 2021 Stephen Hamlet First Amendment Award winner. Um, thank you for uh, taking the time and to everybody who joined us tonight. Thank you. And to quote Gene Kempthorne, the First Amendment rocks. Thanks so much. <laughs>